Welcome back. There's a small device that sparked a big conversation. The Zomato CEO has been seen wearing a gadget called Temple and along with it making a bold claim about aging. The idea is simple enough to catch attention. That gravity, something we live with every single day, could slowly reduce blood flow to the brain. And that over years this might play a role in how we age. Now the claim rests on a basic observation. Humans spend most of their lives upright, the brain sits above the heart and gravity pulls blood downward. And we've heard all all of this over the years. But the argument is that even small daily changes in blood flow could add up over decades. Now this isn't being presented as a medical conclusion. The CEO himself calls it a hypothesis. something he believes is worth exploring but before we get into devices and theories there's also a larger question here why does brain blood flow matter in the first place doctors agree on one thing which is blood flow is critical for brain function it supports memory thinking and overall brain health lower blood flow is often seen as people in uh, is seen as people age and in certain neurological conditions that is an established scientific fundamental that we've seen and heard of over the years but where the debate begins is when claims move beyond that the temple device is described as a research prototype not a medical product there's no published clinical data no regulatory approval and no peer reviewed studies made public so far medical experts point out that the brain is not passive it has its own systems to regulate blood flow posture changes are usually compensated for and aging is not driven by one force alone it is complex and involves multiple systems working together doctors also caution against drawing big conclusions from limited data longevity claims need long term evidence wearable data itself by itself is not diagnosis and correlation does not automatically mean cause so let's discuss this further with our guest joining us this morning kumar bagrodia Founder and lead neuroscientist at NeuroLeap joins us alongside Dr. Shamshed Devedi, director of neurology at Max Super Speciality Hospital. Thank you to the both of you. Good morning, gentlemen. Let's take this morning. conversation forward. It's taken the internet by the storm. Dr. Devedi, if I can begin with you, from a medical standpoint, does wearing a device on the forehead or temple have any proven neurological benefit? The there has been lot of buzz about this device but mm-hmm. the technology behind the device has not yet been revealed and uh, later on uh, the founder himself said that this is still at a research stage so we i don't think he is marketing it at the moment mm-hmm. but yes is it doable yes it is doable today a uh, human race has technology where you can see the blood flow with a small device which like the one which is shown in that image uh and why temple because temple of is that part of the skull which is where the bone is thinnest it is the thinnest area of the brain uh, of the skull so it is easier for the light to penetrate that area and there is a technology uh, which is known as fnirs which is functional near infrared uh spectrometry which is also used uh in pulse oximeter the simple pulse oximeter uses the same technology and with that you can check uh the oxygenated hemoglobin in the brain and that tells you about the uh blood circulation in the brain and this is being used for uh, various in various scientific labs all over the world and the purpose is it is still not available as a wearable device like an apple watch mm. for common man but it is being used to uh, do research on dementia on uh, uh, on brain uh, computer interfacing dr devi the so, so are you telling us and clear this again for us uh, and this, try and tell us whether if you for instance put this device on one part of your head can it or is it capable of science may have not proven it still is it capable of detecting the blood flow overall across your brain so it only tells you the blood flow of the outer the cortex the okay. cortex of the brain not the mm. deep seated areas mm. but the cortex where the gray matter lies is the functional area of the brain where all the processing takes place so the cortex blood flow can be detected with this wearable device and such devices as i am again reiterating is being used for doing research in stroke in neurorehabilitation in dementia etc all over the world and also to create 
robotic assist for people who are disabled because that area of the brain which shows increased activity the computer picks it up and the robo is uh, advised to work accordingly so this kind of research is going on but not it is not available in public realm anywhere okay. in the world still in the research stage mr yeah, bagroria yeah. good morning tell us about the importance why are we having this conversation to begin with it sparked interest there's obviously a set of criticism that's come in as well but interest around how monitoring your blood flow could have or be directly correlated to aging so gravity all of that you know directly was part of this entire conversation why is it finding a place in the mainstream today tell us about the importance of blood flow in the brain relevance to aging so on and so forth um uh, krishmin you you very rightly commented on on some of the basics around the theory of gravity and how that can contribute to aging and and you're absolutely right it is not just one factor which will contribute to accelerated aging or better longevity let's understand two things one yes cerebral blood flow is very important it's very critical to your emotional regulation homeostasis memory cognitive functions but why just the brain you know blood flow is important to every major organ Uh, your heart your kidneys your liver your gut your muscle and skin without getting into the technicalities of how regulated and constant blood flow is important for the heart is important for your gut and your gut brain you know connection your skin your muscles you will not be able to function appropriately for a long period of time if there's not consistent uh, regulated blood flow in every organ of the body mm. yes the brain requires the maximum amount of oxygen and glucose constantly and hence the requirement for cerebral blood flow is perhaps a little bit more important compared to other organs for good functioning now let me just step back here and say uh, first of all uh, i don't know enough about the device uh, that is being spoken of so i wouldn't want to comment on the individual or comment on the device mm. but i would just take a, a step back and say even if you know blood flow is getting restricted and it's a fact if you sit for long hours yeah. at your desk uh, you know as they say sitting is the new smoking so blood flow is impacted but guess what we have tools and techniques available to improve your blood flow so when you move your spine when you do good yogic postures yeah. or certain good exercises where you're twisting bending the spine holding your breath whilst to do it it's almost acting like a mechanical pump to ensure that the blood flow to the brain is accelerated so right habits is all it Hence, takes right imagine monitoring that on absolutely on every single level through the day in a country like india mr bagrodia where anxiety and burnout are rising as is do such devices then offer help or do they end up adding pressure to always performing better well you know uh, i think there is a space for them but only if the person has a severe disorder or a condition mm, yeah. which needs to be monitored for a short period of time um you know uh, it's called interoception which is your mind body connect mm. you know so when you when you feel hunger pangs you know your stomach is grumbling you know you're hungry you don't need a device to tell you how much to eat when to eat and i dare say you know we'll have a device some day which says hey you know please go to the toilet or don't go to the toilet so when do we when do we draw the line mm. on how much of our internal awareness do we want to outsource to an external device we've already outsourced let's say memory you know how many of us rem remember phone numbers all of it is yeah. stored on a mobile phone we've outsourced our ability to navigate with our gps and maps imagine if we start outsourcing our ability to understand how well have i slept yeah. am i feeling hungry am i feeling happy oh come on but wearable yes, tech is I doing that i understand it needs to be done for a short yeah. period of time yes wearable, in in a way yeah. in a way and i must tell you 
And I must tell you, we see enough clients who've been wearing some sort of a ring or some sort of a watch or a gadget which is tracking something. And I get it, it needs to be done for maybe a few weeks so you can understand how your lifestyle, how your food habits, how what you do during the day is impacting certain functions in your brain, body, emotions. But that's it. It shouldn't be done for a long period of time where you become dependent on it. Mm. Where, where you are not able to tell me how well have you slept unless you look at your data from your device. That is bizarre. And that has serious consequences on your brain function. And a lot of times, Mr. Bagrodia, con uh, and, and both of you can correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of times people just end up copy-pasting these kind of, you know, trends. So for instance, someone cool is wearing a smartwatch, slowly everyone wanted to wear a smartwatch. You might not use it for what it's offering or what it is actually bringing to the table, but you nonetheless want to own a smartwatch. Dr. Devedi, when a high profile entrepreneur wears a neuro device publicly, does it risk normalizing unproven science? Because some doctors have come out and criticized this sharply and said, well, there's not enough science to prove it as yet. Why make these kind of statements? So as far as the device which is under discussion is concerned, yeah. if tomorrow it is available on a, a retail shop mm. and there isn't enough scientific backing to uh, the device, I think that is dangerous because mm. of two reasons. Maybe the device is harmless, but it will give a person a false sense of security. If everything, if the data is showing fine, he will get a false sense of security. So there are two risks. One is the risk of the device and the other is a sense of false security. So as uh, Mr. Bagrodia was saying that you are natural, like if I ask in my OPD, uh, if I want to check the sleep of a person, I said, do you feel fresh in the morning when you get up? Mm. And if he says, yes, I don't need any data. If he is feeling fresh after a good night's sleep, everything is fine. I don't need to go into some data to find out whether he's sleeping well or not. Any sleep study I would mandate if there, the person says, no, I don't feel fresh. The whole day I feel groggy and feel sleepy. My sleep is not good. Mm -hmm. Then I will go for the sleep study rather than getting data every day checked. Yeah. So I would say excessive data bombardment is not Dangerous. good for the psyche because then the person gets anxious because of the data. Mm. That data anxiety is picking up in the society. Everybody is bothered about how many steps did I take? Did the Japanese way of living check how many steps the elderly man was taking? It is just a lifestyle. Just make it That's it, sitting is the new smoking, <laughs> like Mr. Bagrodia said. Yeah. And unfortunately, in our busy lives, people are not being able to keep a tab on the number of steps they've walked. So somewhere a little bit of an urgency also comes in. But yes, people need to know where to draw the line. Uh, Mr. Bagrodia, let's leave the temple device alone for a bit. Tell us about the current consumer neurotech sure. overall. Is it anywhere close to actually optimizing brain performance? You know, there's a lot of, uh, unfortunately, a lot of snake oil globally and even in India with uh, neurotech consumer devices being sold. Uh, I would go back to my earlier statement that one needs to realize that if you are doing well in terms of your overall cognitive functions, emotional health, mm. why, is the, why is there a need for you to meddle with that understanding that your mind has with your body? Mm. Very rightfully, as, as the doctor said, you know, we do the same thing. Uh, it's a conversation with a patient or a client to say, how do you feel? And yes, we require objective, measurable data and it's great to have statistics in place longitudinally for a person over his lifespan. That's fantastic. But it cannot replace interoception. It cannot replace the person's ability to describe what they feel about their own situation. Beyond the point, data itself is just for data's sake. And yes, there is a place for us to get some good insights. You know, whether we like it or not, healthcare today is entirely data driven. 
how can you go and treat a person without getting, let's say, blood work done or without getting imaging done? But that does not mean that you do an X-ray every day, an MRI every day, you know, a, a blood work every day, right? You need to be able to decide for yourself how much is enough, how much will you rely on externalizing your awareness, and there is a huge risk to it. So in the current scheme of things, a lot of the neurotech devices, I dare say, are honestly just selling snake oil. There have been so many companies in India and abroad which started with huge fanfare, uh, a lot of funding backed by billionaire founders and have quickly shut shop. Mm -hmm. uh, also, because even though it might be scientifically proven, doesn't mean you need to use it all the time. It isn't there a necessity. Was a time it's not a necessity. You can it, it, survive without these right. high-tech gadgets. I, I am left with the last uh, minute or so and quickly Dr. Devedi, for anyone who cannot either afford or doesn't believe in this kind of a wearable tech gadget, you know, wants to just keep up with a healthy routine, but at the same time we're looking at blood flow in your brain, how important it is or overall for your brain health, for the other organs in your body, what would your, you know, suggestions be on the things that they need to do every day, apart from, let's say, c session or the headstand, which is going to exactly do that. What are the things they can include in their daily routine? I think the most important thing is a good night's sleep. If I have to, I have to choose between exercise and sleep. Sleep is more important and I'm not joking. For the brain health particularly, sleep is more important than exercise because sleep is the time when your brain is uh, being housekeeped. All the toxins which you produce during the day, it is the sleep which takes it out and throws into the bloodstream and out of your body. If the sleep is compromised and somebody starts to mimic somebody else, that wo to hai sota. he only sleeps for six hours, so I will also try it. That is dangerous. Your sleep requirement is decided by your genetics. Don't try to imitate somebody. Sleep well. Exercising on a a sleep-deprived body is like rubbing salt to a wound. That is dangerous. And that is why so many morbidities, heart attacks, etc. are taking place. Correct. More sleep, more than exercise. All those exercises equally or maybe a little less important. There's another story post this, which is despite getting a 7 or an 8 hour sleep, sometimes people don't wake up fresh. So that's another story for another day possibly. But thank you to the both of you for joining in and really sharing your thoughts with this thank one you. conversation that's taken the internet by storm.